Welcome to all of you uh, for this third online meeting, Xnovation Talk, dedicated to innovation and its actors, organized by the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Department of the Ecole Polytechnique. My name is Mathilde Pruvot, and I'm attached to the uh, Communication Department of this direction. And today we are going we are going to deal with the mixed reality serving of digital twins from human to industry 4.0. So uh, we'll talk about connection between virtual world, digital design, and real world. And for that session, we are very, very happy to welcome um, four guests. And uh, so uh, first, Laurent Chrétien, General Manager at uh, Laval Virtual. David Naon, uh, Immersive Virtuality Director at Dassault System. And uh, François Guterres, CTO and Project Lead at uh, Arfunk 3D. And uh, last but not least, Jan Guggenheimer uh, from Telecom Paris who is a researcher at Information Processing and Communication uh, lab, uh, labor Laboratory. And he works with Samuel Huron, uh, who is not there today, but he works with him and is a researcher in design and information and communication technology. So uh, Xnovation Center is uh, offer four uh, support programs aimed at a wide variety of profiles such as project uh, leaders, startups, corporate students, uh, student entrepreneurs, of course, researcher, PhD students, researcher entrepreneurs also. And those three, four programs are uh, XUP, XTech Booster, XFAB and X Corporate. So I'm going to show you um, a short video recording presenting the Dry X Innovation Center. And uh, after we will go on. So thank you for your attention. Welcome to the Dry X Innovation Center. Located in the heart of the campus, it is a 5,000 square meters building dedicated to innovation and entrepreneurship. Let's begin with Ixup, the incubator of the DRAX. Ixup is an intensive training program over six months that's aimed at supporting early stage deep tech startups. Uh, we have more than 40 workshops and we have one coach per startup that supports our businessmen to develop very fast their project during the acceleration program. Uh, we have also 40 workshops on different areas like technology, the business, sales and marketing, and communication. Except it's not a program for students, but in any case, we would like to facilitate the exchange between students and startups. For this reason, we organize several meetings between students and startups. We offer the possibility to make internships at startups and even during the second year of the education part of our students, we offer the opportunity to work on the technical subject proposed by our startups. The ICSAP program is a great opportunity for entrepreneurs to grow their idea into a fully grown company. Take SpaceSense, for example. We are the two co-founders of SpaceSense. At SpaceSense, we bring insights from satellite imagery available to everyone with the help of artificial intelligence. We use space data for art to help in agriculture, environment, climate change, and also for governments to make efficient policies. And uh, we joined the incubator of Ecole Polytechnique after being here students as uh, in the Master of Entrepreneurship. And it really helped us improve our product and it also gave us a very good access to the Spatial uh, Student Center, which was very beneficial for us. And now, thanks to the support, we are, have raised funds and we are hiring our first employees. But the DRAX isn't only about early deep tech startups. Maybe you're a more mature company and you want to be part of the Plateau de Saclay International Scientific and Innovation Hub, then you could be part of XTech. And there is more. Whatever you need, there is a program for you in the Dry Innovation Center. 
you'll be taken care of every step of the way. Let's say you want to build a prototype. You can do that too with XFab. XFab is a prototyping space specialized in digital fabrication thanks to more than 30 numerically controlled machines. It is also certified as FabLab. This nurturing interdisciplinary environment is able to host and support a wide variety of projects, expanding the reach of practical trainings, bringing awareness to Industry 4.0, manufacturing and design challenges is what this place can bring to teaching. With our team of experts and with our partners, we ignite, we ship and support hardware entrepreneurship. So, come and join us! If you are a researcher, it is a place not so far from the lab where you can try something different after your thesis. Je suis Romain Labbé, président fondateur de Feeling. Donc, Feeling est une entreprise spécialisée en mesures de force pour le sport, notamment le sport de haut niveau pour tout ce qui est prévention de blessures et mesures de performance. Et notre entreprise est partie de nos thèses donc, qu a fait, que j'ai fait avec mon associé au LADIX, donc au laboratoire d'hydrodynamique de l'école polytechnique, où nous travaillions à l'époque sur la physique de l'aviron et où ensuite nous avons continué à développer toutes les thématiques de mesures de force dans notre entreprise. Feeling est basé à l'école polytechnique au sein de la pépinière d'entreprise. The Dry X Innovation Center is a key component of the Polytechnic campus. It is a place where you can grow your ideas, come for an internship, learn to build things, hire or be hired. We can't wait to meet you and make your projects a reality. Nice to see you, everybody. My name is Laurent. Um, I'm uh, the general manager of uh, Laval Virtual. So um, just a small introduction on Laval Virtual, which is a non-governmental organization. Uh, and we, um, I'm trying to share my screen, but yeah, here it is. Um, uh, historically, Laval Virtual is the first uh, and the oldest organizer of uh, uh, event for virtual reality and augmented reality in the world, uh, and also the biggest one because uh, the last edition in 2019 um, gathered uh, 300 exhibitors and almost 20,000 people. So uh, if you want to look for uses and technologies of virtual reality, no need to go to CES or MWC. You can come to Laval every year. And this year it will be from uh, 7 to the 9th of July. Uh, and I can show you just to, so that you understand what we are doing, um, a small video on, uh, on the event in introduction. So here you have the video, full screen, and I hope the noise, the sound is good. It's okay for the, for the sound? Thanks. So um, this was our first activity, uh, organizer of events. Then uh, we are also um, in charge of uh, a dedicated to VRAR Innovation Center, where we are dealing with hardware, software, and, and a lot of, uh, of use cases. Uh, and we are helping the, 
the companies in our ecosystem to 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 go ahead with the projects and to 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 grow faster. Um, so this is our second uh, activity, and um, next after we will see the third one at at, at the end, which uh, which is due to to what we have uh, lived during this uh, year 2020, and uh, and uh, and it's a new new activity. We'll say speaking about uh, digital twins. So. Um, I'm in charge to introduce the digital twins, the concept of digital twin, and I would like to say that, uh, in fact, it's quite simple. Uh, I will show you just after a, a video where you can see uh, a lot of example, uh, but let's say that the digital twin is just a replica of, uh, of something true. Uh, it's a, it's a, whether an object, a system, an implementation of process or whatever. What is interesting to, to see is that uh, there is two ways to to, uh, to give life to your digital twin. The first one is um, um, using, uh, for example, scans or uh, or um, sensors to, to to get the data, and you you like that you will uh, create and you will uh, produce your your uh, your digital model. Uh, or you can also have a top-down approach, and in this case, it's uh, it's through simulation, through, through uh, numeric uh, simulation that you will create your your digital twins. Um, I, I will say also at this stage that um, uh, this uh, we we are all together working. Uh, I mean, with uh, with David, uh, with Ian, and, and Francois, we are working a lot with. Uh, Dealing a lot with VR and AR, let's say with uh, visual technologies and uh, haptic technologies and sound technologies, but um, in the digital twin matter, you you can also um, have a lot of uh, um, artificial intelligence, uh, IoT, uh, and probably blockchain soon. So uh, all these technologies are really mixed, and we can see this. Uh, uh, on uh, on Laval Virtual uh, every year, so um, I will try. I will start by uh, an example. Um, a lot of big companies are interested in uh, in uh, in the digital twins, uh, starting by by the so system uh, uh, in France. But you, you can see uh, Siemens, Bosch, uh, IBM, uh, PTC, Oracle, Microsoft. Uh, Cisco, G, all these companies are dealing with this, uh, this subject. So let me show you this video of uh, of Siemens because um, I I think it's a, it's a good uh, it's a good introduction to understand uh, what we what we are presenting you. So um, next one here it is. Digital twins, the innovation backbone of the future delivering virtual representations of real-world products, systems, and cities. For example, the digital twin of an electric motor not only showcases form, but also analyzes functions, from the rotation of the shaft, to thermal conductivity, to data from sensors and beyond. What's more, the digital twin continuously evolves. Thanks to the flow of data, user experience feedback, and new input, and it's greatly impacting development, production, and operation. In development, a product's behavior can be simulated and tested long before a physical prototype has been built. Siemens utilized the digital twin to develop a world record-setting electric aircraft motor that not only weighs 50 kilograms, but is also five times more powerful than comparable electric motors. But it doesn't stop there. Digital twins also unleash the power of 3D printing. In a recent Siemens study for gas mixing systems, insights from the simulation of form and flow behavior were combined with generative algorithms. The result? A truly unique channel shape and configuration, one significantly more efficient than anything previously designed. Even entire factories down to individual machines can be simulated and tested. For instance, robots. It's difficult for them to perform milling tasks because large forces in the manufacturing process lead to inaccurate movements. But with the digital twin, the forces that push the robot away from the milling path can be calculated and compensated in real time, keeping the robot in its path. 
When it comes to operations, digital twins can compare the sensor data of a real point in real time with the simulation of its point. The availability of the point parallel to operations can be reliably predicted, and sudden disruptions become a thing of the past. But this is just the beginning, and Siemens is already driving the future. Merging digital twins with artificial intelligence allows computers to independently design advanced products. Siemens is realizing this potential right now with Californian startup Hackrod, which aims to build customized sports cars. For development, production, and operation, the digital twin breaks with traditional paradigms and opens up extraordinary possibilities. That's why digital twins are the innovation backbone of the future. Siemens. So uh, this was uh, this was a good introduction, and uh, and also to understand that uh, those technologies are uh, dealing with several sector of activities, with a lot, in fact, of, se of uh, sector of activities, such as uh, industry. Uh, um, aeronautics or uh, car industry, such as uh, mining, such as uh, medical field. So on all this, we have some video that Mathilde can share to, to, to you later on, um, and so that you can understand what is uh, going on with, uh, with these technologies or with buildings also. Uh, um, so please understand that those technologies will, um, um, at, at least uh, uh, digital twins, is uh, is um, well, very important for a lot of uh, a lot of uh, sector of, of activities, and uh, also, uh, and it is the last uh, thing that we that we did probably for the event. So it's not really digital twins, but we are going uh, towards uh, um, virtual worlds, uh, reproducing partly the reality, but also inventing new realities and new place to, to, to live. And um, because of the, of the COVID, we, we had to uh, virtualize completely our event. And after, um, after uh, let's say, eight months, we are now almost at 100 events that we have organized. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot uh, with, uh, with avatars that are maybe uh, tomorrow, but we will ask this to, to our speakers, uh, our own digital twin, uh, human digital twin. And uh, just let me show you uh, what, uh, what can be done with, uh, with virtual events. As an example, also, here it is. Probably you have seen uh, uh, in this. Uh, here, here we are. I will stop. Okay. Hello. Uh, can you just? Uh, oh. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. So now, now we. Is it okay, uh, Laurent? <laughs> yes. Ah, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I was hearing some some sound, but it's 
it was not you. Okay, so I, I will stop the sharing of my of my screen now. Uh, probably you have seen that uh, in in the in the small video that we that I share um, that we were speaking also about uh, AFXR, which is the the French Association for uh, Virtual Reality and Augmented Reality. And David is uh, is uh, David Naon is. Uh, not only uh, working for the system, but also vice president of uh, this association. So I'm happy to to give you the 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 mic. And yes, the mic exactly. Can you all hear me and see my uh, PowerPoint? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for, for this invitation. Um, so yes, my name is David Naon. I, I am uh, in charge of the innovation activities of DASO system regarding uh, the use of uh, immersive technologies. Um, so in the 3D Experience Lab, uh, which is the uh, open innovation uh, laboratory of DASO system. And also, and thank you, Laurent, for mentioning, uh, I'm one of the founding members of the AFXR and the vice president. Um, I will probably uh, not speak too much about the AFXR later on, um, but for, for you to know, um, you can actually find our website on afxr.org. It's mostly, uh, it's in French, uh, it's for the French uh, audience and it's uh, really the community of uh, all the professionals that are uh, working for or with the uh, immersive technologies and uh, uh, enables to uh, uh, I would say join forces and be uh, going uh, uh, further uh, together rather than fast alone but maybe yes further so have a look at our website you can register to our newsletter or even uh, become a member it's actually free or you can give whatever you want to support the association and uh, we'll be happy to have you w would you be a, an expert or or not in those domains we want to make sure that we we all join forces okay now back to a little bit more of my core activity at DASO system um, uh, as uh, uh, Laurent said, we we are very much into this uh, domain of uh, digital twin. I, I will do a focus on that. But now we uh, we want to speak about what is this MR mixed reality or whatever stuff. So I'll be very fast on that. But I want to make sure that we all understand what we're talking about. So basically, when a user is actually interacting with his or her body, the actual experience. Uh, uh, is able to react to its action and allow the user to perceive the, the reaction of, of the experience. And that's a closed loop. And if this loop is, is fast enough, um, it's going to be uh, to, to, to create something which we could call immersion, or I mean, we call that immersive virtuality, meaning that, and that's our definition, there is really something different in the brain of the user. So I'm not an expert on, on neuroscience, although I had a lot of uh, users and customers of my product uh, in, in the domain of uh, neuroscience and, and all that. So let me uh, quote what Roland Jouvan, who, who is at uh, Pitié Salpêtrière, uh, one of the, um, I hope I'm not saying, uh, I would say one of the professors. Um, and he's using a very interesting metaphor to describe the brain in general. I mean, that is not just restricted to, to anything VR. Um, but what he says is that we, our brain is made of two animals or two um, persons. Uh, the inner brain, he calls the horse, which is made of the limbic and the reptilian brains and the neocortex, which he calls the rider. Um, so, you may know that the rider is really what makes us different to animals. Um, and this is uh, where um, actually we have the capacity to do a lot of abstraction and uh, language and, uh, and uh, a lot of stuff that makes us different to animals. But what we want to focus here is the inner brain. The, the limbic brain is the one of the emotions and the reptilian brain is the one of the security and the, the very reactive things like a lizard. And basically what I would like to propose to you is that we consider this uh, immersive virtuality as being the capacity to speak to the horse and not to directly to the rider and potentially to overcome the, 
I mean, to bypass what the rider is is, is able to to control, while on the horse. Let me put the camera here because actually, when I look at uh, my colleagues here, uh, it doesn't make sense. So, so when I look at uh, when a horse is is, for instance, uh, riding. I mean running very fast and, and suddenly a, a dog is coming on the way, it's not the rider who is able to avoid any uh, injury or whatever of the horse. It's the horse himself. The horse will jump or will, will stop or whatever. And that's uh, very, very fast, very, very instinctive. And the rider cannot do anything about that. And so basically, immersive virtuality is the capacity to talk to this horse directly potentially bypassing the rider for good or for bad. And I think we'll have, a, I hope, a, an interesting discussion with, uh, with Jan later on about the bad, uh, because uh, it's not all, all uh, uh, blue. Uh, but basically, when we manage to do that, we are able to create a much uh, tighter relation between the, the user and the, and the virtual world. And so if we keep this in mind, uh, we can really differentiate what is a uh, real-time 3D interactive um, experience and immersive experience. And, and I think we, we want here to talk about the, this mixed reality continuum, this immersive experience, where um, we go from the real to the virtual. And, and this is, sorry for you, uh, Microsoft, that you did not invent a mixed reality word uh, uh, because it was quoted first by uh, uh, those researchers in, in 94 and the previous century. Um, and mixed reality is really all this continuum here from reality to virtuality. Um, and um, we, we it, it, we do happen to call this immersive virtuality at DESO system by, because we, we're more interested into the result of these technologies and what they do with the user. But if you want to talk about the technologies, now uh, most people uh, use XR just to speak about whatever reality. So um, would it be M, V, or A? And um, also because it's stands for extended reality, which is this new paradigm, I would say, where uh, realities are are now uh, uh, the real world is extended by the virtual world. And, and that's really what uh, digital twins are about. Um, and so now I'm going to, to briefly, because I mean, I would like to, to keep my presentation to, to five, to, to 10 to, to 15 minutes, but um, if you take this uh, spiral that uh, we, you could call spiral of innovation, but most of the people are calling the value framework. When I say people, I mean our customers and that's a system. So all these industrial um, uh, actors, uh, industries that are uh, designing and selling, um, making products, and they all agree that it all follows this kind of uh, life cycle. So basically, at the beginning, some, some, someone will think about a new product. So that's more the why and start to design a first um, an early sketch or something that allows to, to elaborate uh, what product is going to, to be at stake here. And then this product is being developed uh, by engineers and, and uh, mechanical or electrical or, or system engineers and simulate in all possible uh, variants um, and then or, or even okay physically then but the, the manufacturing process will itself be developed as well um, and often uh, all this happen in parallel while the product are being designed and engineered the, the way to produce them is also going to be uh, designed and engineered so there's not only a twin of the product itself like the car but of the factory where the car will be produced. So there's, so the manufacturing world is, is by itself a kind of spiral itself because it, it follows the same cycle as the, as the product design. And then the product will be sold. So it will be released, it will be on the market and then it's had to be sold. Uh, it has to be advertised. So that's the brand experience. And it has to be 
uh, explained to the final users, potentially the, the final consumers of how to, to, to use it. And then the product will have its life and potentially um, if it's a large equipment, all that it has to be maintained. It is even a car uh, has to be maintained like uh, serviced. Um, and you have to train also uh, uh, the, 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 the people to, to actually do this maintenance and servicing. So this spiral is actually a general um, value framework. And what uh, you saw in these little boxes are actual use cases, I would say micro use cases of what these industries, those manufacturing or product life cycle industries are actually um, uh, deploying. Um, these are those six use cases. Uh, I have given on screen a, a few of those examples. I'm not going to describe them right away. Um, but just what I wanted to say is that um, I'm going to try to, to briefly uh, explain all those six um, using a model that uh, I should have presented before. So please apologize if I skip that one, which is basically we said about this action perception loop, which allows to create a very natural and simple experience because it talks to the horse. So you don't have to think about what you're being taught or about what you're being exposed to. You just um, live it. So anyone can do this to look behind. Anyone can grab something. Anyone can walk. Anyone can uh, rotate his or her head towards someone else, which is very valuable in, in this virtual uh, conference world, for instance. Uh, so that's very natural and simple. Uh, but basically, why do people use VR and AR in those uh, industries? It's to do either enter something in the brain of the user or get something out of the brain of the user. So basically touch, deeply touch the user because you speak to the emotional brain. So it has a, a longer lasting and a, a deeper experience and uh, bring useful insight, insights because the person is going to behave in this virtual world. And, and so he can share or, or even show his emotions and his um, wishes and, and everything in a very, very uh, instinctive and simple way. Um, so you get a lot of information. So this is why the first very um, valuable use case is the one where uh, you do actually virtual prototyping. You are modeling and simulating the usage of this future product or factory or, or whatever you're thinking of putting on the building. And, um, and where it's very, very uh, disruptive for the industry, it's because, as I said, everyone is able to use an immersive experience after a first moment of discovery. And that means that you can ask, for instance, a retailer to, to co-design with you a, a store. You can even take a final uh, a consumer and have that person sit inside a, a car and, and describe if, if he's happy or not about his experience. Uh, you can have an actual worker work on the factory itself and say, hey, but I cannot reach that or or where is that that you know it's and really be part of this design process while previously this person could only look at a small screen and uh, on the upon the shoulder of the actual designer and 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 could just say mm, uh, yeah well um, and it was not really obvious so this is really the big big transformational uh, part of, of of the in the process and uh, the second very interesting and important uh, one is uh, what we call understand complexity. It's basically um, you want to, again, to get from someone um, the, the, the knowledge of what has to be done because it's too complex to, to just understand what's happening. And as you saw um, in the it also applies at the ownership at the very late time. And that is close to one of the, the, the what was said by Laurent. Um, if the factory 
is for instance or the 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 plant is already in operation all the iot's and all that data is already active and providing data um, and if you explore this in an immersive way um, you are going to much better understand um, which valve is faulty because it's located here, it's after that one, and that one is giving me uh, this information and not that one. So uh, maybe it's, it's this one we should replace. And you can save a huge time by not having to send someone there to actually explore uh, more closely because you have been able to embrace a, a, a very, very, uh, very much a lot of, of data. And same for like simulation results, like a crash analysis that you can see here on a, on a Z space. Uh, same for uh, simulation results for, for airflow uh, and all that. So this is really, really uh, an interesting use case. Um, it's very much known that learning is much better when doing things. Um, so VR has proved uh, for a lot of use cases that involving the body and triggering inner part of the brain is able to make this knowledge enter very deeply into the brain. And this is why training someone at procedures or training someone to uh, do a specific complex gesture is proved to be efficient in VR. Uh, in most of the cases, there are some cases it's not, but most of the time it is. Uh, and it, it lasts longer and so on for the neural reason I, I, I explained previously. Um, then we have the augmented operation um, where, hoping this is going to work. No, it's not, Never mind. It, this is when you want to um, help a, a worker at the assembly time or at the maintenance time to uh, get all the data this person has to have while doing this operation. And in particular, um, like maintenance or, or assembly instructions, um, having this merge uh, uh, information in front of you of what to do and, and, and the real world is reducing uh, uh, the cognitive loss of, 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 the, of the worker and uh, uh, increases quality and efficiency and, and security for by freeing the hand. So very famous and valuable use case, uh, highly waiting for uh, uh, classes that could be uh, deployed at scale and, and, and be affordable. I'm trying to be fast. Uh, we're reaching the two last ones. Uh, brand experience is really to advertise uh, uh, like a new product. Um, this was like Jaguar Land Rover has been uh, uh, showing their first electric vehicle by having a hundred of their journalists wear a, a, a VR headset and, and look at the, this kind of immersive experience. Uh, so you want to have this key message, it's a bit like training, enter the brain of the user. And the sales experience is going to be when um, you want uh, you really are going to do a, a, a purchasing experience and select the uh, product that you really want to purchase and own. This uh, video I'm showing is, is a, a, a true use case that we, uh, as a service, develop for the DS brand from the PSA group, um, where basically now there's more than uh, 90 dealership places where you enter the room. It's just empty except one seat one HTC Vive and uh, the two controllers. And the user is having this kind of experience, um, uh, being able to choose the various options and have at the end the, the list of options. The key value of that is that at the end of the purchasing operation, it could be the same with a sofa at your home with a, with a tablet or whatever, um, you are quite sure that the product you you are experiencing is going to be the one that you really want to have. So it's a, it's a kind of tryout experience uh, that works on your own body or on your own room or anywhere. And that is uh, definitely a, a killer value in the B2C already and, and for quite a long time in the B2B world. I'm not going to present you this slide, but just, just be aware that if you're interested, you can contact uh, me um, and I could show you 
the various solutions that we already have on, on the market that enables to cover all these use cases uh, with various products from different brands. Um, and uh, I think for now, I'm going to let the floor to, uh, to Francois, I think. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So yes, we will go on with uh, Francois Guitas. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Mathilde. I will, share. I will share my presentation right now. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very, very well. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mathilde. Uh, thank you to the Dry Center and thank you to all the um, panelists. Um, I'm Francois Guterres, uh, CTO of Arcon3D. Our main uh, core activity is to develop, uh, build, develop, sell uh, 3D software technology targeted for the industry. Uh, meaning uh, we develop our own 3D tech and we use it uh, on some occasion. Uh, with our clients or partners to develop uh, industrial products. Uh, I'm very glad of the presentation that uh, David uh, did uh, just previously because uh, I'm going to illustrate uh, what we've done with our technology um, in the field of uh, digital twins. So I'm going to start with a very, very super simple uh, case. It's almost a proof of concept. The main question is uh, digital twins. Uh, how can, how is it made? How can I make, in, make a digital twin myself? The main idea is that you have uh, a physical device and uh, you have a virtual representation of the physical device. So the virtual representation obviously is the digital twin. What we try to do is see, okay, let's take our technology. Uh, let's take a very simple language. So we're talking about the Python language, which is very, very simple. And in like uh, a very few line of code, we are, we are able to make a very simple uh, proof of concept of a digital twin. The main idea is that uh, you, you don't need a video of a robot to do some monitoring. You just need very, very little data. Uh, this data, you can make to travel it uh, through a network and uh, build an image uh, remotely. It's basically a very simple supervision case. Okay. So here it's super simple. You have just this uh, device, which is basically uh, a tool to measure uh, 3D objects. We get data from the device, we send it to the engine and we display the image. And here you have a very simple digital twin. Uh, it's quite technical, I'm sorry, but just to show that in less than uh, 100 line of code, you have uh, what you've just seen in the video. So this is our technology, Arfan. Uh, it's a French uh, 3D engine. It's uh, written in C++, but we decided to open it as uh, to as many languages as possible. And we are increasing uh, the amount of languages that allow people, engineers, uh, designers, researchers to work with our technology. So at the moment we have uh, four languages and of course it's uh, mandatory to support the very uh, very basic uh, platforms such as Windows or Linux for the industry. And what if, uh, what if it takes a very simple proof of concept and we decide to invert uh, the way the data will travel. We take the data from the virtual twin and we send it to the physical device. Then we have a remote control. Mm -hmm. 
What David uh, told us uh, in his presentation is that you can use digital Turing to extract uh, information from the brain. Uh, this uh, study will show you how we use our technology to conduct a study for the French railways uh, company and uh, try to get as many information as possible from a panel of uh, users, the people like you and me who are using train uh, uh, all the time. So we uh, started to imagine what could be, what could the study uh, help us to get, uh, uh, to get uh, information. Basically, uh, there are a few uh, train stations in France uh, where users have to cross uh, the rails. Uh, it's quite a dangerous situation and there are uh, even today a lot of accidents. So the idea is to try to improve the signing, the road sign to allow people to better understand what they are, what, why they need to, be, to pay attention when crossing the railways. So in this case, virtual reality helps us to get a lot of data from what is happening when someone is experiencing, uh, uh, when is, someone is crossing the railway. We can get some A data, uh, which means we can see where the user is exactly looking. We can get, get some body kinematics data, how fast am I working, uh, if even I am running. We can get some physiologic data uh, like the uh, heartbeats, stuff like that. And of course, everything is uh, recorded in video. So um, in, a kind of, in a case of a scientific study, we can match all the data and see what, it, what happens. So this is the real life environment. It's a very typical train station in France. And as you can see, uh, the users will have to cross uh, the railway. And this is the dangerous situation. So we made a copy in virtual reality. Uh, we made a copy that looks like most of uh, this kind of train station. And the most important part of the copy is uh, the railway, uh, the railway passage. What VR allow us is to even test bed some specific signing, such as this one or this one. It's exactly the same situation, just the signs are different. So we can compare, do some um, as test as many tests as we want. So this is how it how it works. So this is captured from within the 3D headset, within the virtual reality headset. We did this experiment uh, during the summer. Uh, more than 100 people uh, tried this, uh, uh, this experiment. The whole experiment lasts for like two hours. And uh, as you can see, uh, we have the people uh, walking in uh, quite a large space and experiencing what happens exactly in a train station. They have to pay attention. Uh, is, are there any train? We can try different kinds of scenarios. And of course, they don't know they are tested. Uh, they don't know they are tested for uh, the accident situation. It's completely another story that we tell us. We tell them that um, they are going to experience uh, future uh, future equipment in a train station. So as you can see, everything is synchronized. We can go backward. Uh, and every every data we can extract from the VR, from the digital twin and in fine from the brain, every data is stored in a database. So we can we can study all this. It happens sometimes that uh, some people will uh, not pay attention to the train and uh, go to a collision. It uh, it did happen. So what do we extract from this? Uh, mostly uh, the most visual uh, data I can show you, I can share with you is a point cloud. Point cloud shows, this point cloud shows where the user, uh, one specific user during one experiment, where uh, his eyes uh, looked at. 
and the more red it is, uh, the more he looked at uh, some specific point of the of the digital twin. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have the train, we have some road signs, and we have this data for every people who went uh, through the experiment. So this is a very typical case of oh, how can we extract data? I really like the expression, how can we extract data from the brain using virtual reality, using um, using our technology and uh, everything that uh, was made during the experiment is implemented in Python. Uh, the very language that we use for this kind of stuff, uh, which allows us to do some iterative uh, uh, developments very quickly. So that's for uh, that's all for this uh, VR study. Uh, then I will show quickly, very quickly, uh, I'm not uh, allowed to share too many uh, visuals about it. Uh, another use case of something that is at the edge of what could be a digital twin, uh, which means what if could bring our technology uh, in a vehicle, in a, in a car. Uh, we almost of, uh, we all know this, uh, this diagram. It's the, pro the life cycle of a product. We will first create it. It's everything that uh, David told us, so I will skip quite quickly. Uh, the product can be first will be created, then we can use AR and VR. Uh, then we enter into the design stage, then we enter in the build stage where people and machines will actually build the product. Then we need to sell it, to show it. And once the product is in, on the market, we will need to maintain it. And it's all, all this case, we can take some advantage of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. But what? What if we could use 3D technology in the product itself? Meaning uh, what if we could use 3D technology in a vehicle, in a car? And that's uh, where we are quite uh, efficient with uh, our phone. Um, because um, in addition to VR or AR, uh, our technology is able to run on very, very small uh, type of CPUs and GPUs, very small type of hardware. Uh, so we have uh, at this moment um, a product running in a prototype vehicle with, uh, made by Valeo. Uh, which basically is a augmented reality for the vehicle, for the driver to help the driver to better understand what's going on, what's going on on the road. Um, as you can see in the, in the that diagram, the vehicle uh, with this sensors will get many as many data, data as possible. It's a lidar, it's a camera. All these data are sent to the 3D engine, and our position in this project is to provide the 3D technology that can run uh, on a very small CPU that is embedded in a vehicle. Okay. Um, my last topic will be um, the project we did with uh, Dry Center. Uh, we have a VR training uh, project we developed for the XFAB. Uh, and this is another topic that uh, David uh, told us about, which means how do you send data to the brain? How do we train people? Uh, the question is, uh, we have people in an industrial environment, uh, typically uh, blue colors, and we want to train them uh, to what they will have to do in, this, in the factory. So we need to make a copy, a double, a twin of the factory and train them with as many scenarios as possible. For that, the VR is uh, the best uh, option. So we were challenged by a company as uh, known as Sonovision, who is, has a track record of 70 years in making uh, technical documentation for the aeronautics, railways, and uh, oil and gas uh, energies. And they told us, OK, you know, uh, we know that everyone is able to make training uh, using VR tools. But what if we need to build it at an industrial scale, which means uh, they have hundreds of scenarios uh, to build in VR. Um, so it's quite a challenge. And we build them with them. We build a technology uh, based on our phone. And we tested, uh, we tested it uh, at, 
at the dry center. So it's very simple. Uh, what is about what is they are turning? It's telling people, okay, go there, uh, open this door, take this tool. Uh, it's very very simple. It's going to some place and using your hands to interact with objects. As long as we can do that very simple, we are able to build uh, VR 3D content at an industrial scale. So again, this is uh, an example of uh, how it looks like when we build it. Uh, it's down to very simple instruction. Uh, you need to start sound because you want uh, the immersive experience to be complete. You want to tell uh, the trainee to move to some place. So, okay, I will, the VR will ask the user to go someplace. You want the user to take an object, to take a tool to anything. And eventually you want to start some animation to make the experience richer. And with this, we were able to build uh, industrial training at an industrial scale. So this is uh, one of the room uh, inside the dry center. Uh, this is uh, the XFAB prototyping space, uh, allowing students, uh, research, researcher, and um, entrepreneurs, uh, Mathilde could uh, correct me, to uh, build their own prototype. So we have in front of uh, what is on the photo is a laser uh, die cutter. Uh, this kind of tool is quite dangerous. Uh, you can potentially harm yourself or other people if you don't use it properly. So the question is, how do we make a digital twin of the whole uh, this whole space? So we did uh, we did uh, an exact copy of this space, uh, helped with uh, by Aline Beck, who was in charge of the uh, XFAB uh, prototyping uh, of this uh, prototyping space, and this is uh, how the copy uh, actually looks like. You want to be uh, as faithful as possible as what it looks like in reality, because the brain will not be, will not accept um, the simulation if it's not uh, close enough to what happens in the reality. So this is how it works. It's a very short uh, example. So the VR is uh, the VR system is uh, guiding the user, uh, telling him, okay, now you need to go to this place. You need to get near to the printer. You need to switch it on. Okay, it's done. Now you need to mm -hmm. open it, and everything is scripted as uh, I showed you. So this is uh, actually working at the Dray Center. You can use it. And students, uh, researchers, entrepreneurs who want to use uh, this printer are able to train themselves uh, using this system. It's an exact copy. The table is the same. The phone is the same. Everything is the same. So that uh, concludes our pre my presentation of uh, what uh, what we did uh, and what we are doing uh, with our technology, which of course is uh, available for any company, industrial company who wants to uh, get their hands on a 3D technology which is built in France, uh, which is completely safe. And um, if you have any question, uh, you could uh, please connect on the site and uh, contact us. Thank you, Mathilde. Thank I... you very much, Francois. <laughs> very interesting. Um, yes, we, we, uh, we go uh, through uh, the presentation with um, Jan. <laughs> yes, let Thank me you, quickly Jan. share my screen. Uh, that one? Um, uh, for the audience, it's free to to ask for your question uh, just, just right now, and we will ask for uh, we will re reply to it uh, just after the Gen presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so is everyone able to see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, we, we can see it. It's perfect. Um, so thanks of all uh, for us to um, have me here and um, give me the audience to present some of the work that we're doing. Um, 
I have to say, uh, maybe I'm a little bit the odd one out in this round because there's less um, applicable work directly to some products that we're going to talk about, but a little bit more about the, let's say, general approach to uh, mixed reality and augmented reality that we have in the, um, um, yeah, from the human computer interaction um, research part. Um, so, a quick introduction. Um, my name is Jan Guggenheimer. I'm a Meta Conference at Telecom Paris working at the intersection of human computer interaction and mixed reality and unfortunately not with me um someone who is also a colleague um, that is working with me on some of the projects that i'm going to talk about in a second um so um i think we saw some of the perspectives on towards augmented virtual mixed reality in the realm of digital twins and an application of industry um i want to give you a little bit of a different perspective that we are having um let's say from an um uh, academic side where we are or particularly in the research that we do um we are looking at uh, mixed reality as one part of technology that will exist so in the basic or in the basic concept of human computer interaction we're trying to explore how humans are interacting with computing technology to some degree and um, what is interesting to observe is that the shape of computing, and this is an, um, a work that was done by Mark Weiss at one point, he argued there was different waves of computing, has changed over the last histories that we have. So there was a, a strong um, phase where uh, mainframe computing was the dominant uh, type of technology we were used. We had a phase where personal computing were like quite dominant, and now we are a little bit in the face of mobile computing, our dominant platform, so to say. And the question that we are asking ourselves in the, um, in the HCI research community is oftentimes, How's, what's the trajectory going to go, right? Where are we going? Where are we heading? Are we going to use phones for the next 20 years? Or is it going to be in the next edition that could come? And one trend that you can observe is that technology in general is coming closer to its humans, right? So we had mainframes somewhere in a, in a specific dedicated place, but we have already smartphones that are um, in our pockets every day where we are. So one of the argumentation could be that people say, oh yeah, it's going to be something wearable, it's going to be some form of wearable technology, augmented reality, virtual reality to some degree. And there is even a field of uh, research that goes a little bit in the philosophical parts of transhumanism, to what degree are we actually going to be um, um, well merged or extended to some form of technology. Um, but I want to argue here that this is conceptually not that relevant for us. Um, because it only talks about this type of technology, and we are more interested in the underlying paradigm, the interaction paradigm. So let me clarify this. Um, if we look again at this trend, the way that we interacted with mainframe computers was mainly through command line interfaces, one dimensional interface where we inputted text, or even like batch cards, uh, like if you really go far. Graphical user interfaces already had a two dimensional um, interaction paradigm. Right. So we had um, 2D screens and we were able to display graphical user interfaces. And the idea of spatial computing, what is next step, is going to be that we are able to change. And we saw wonderful examples of this already. We're able to change and manipulate the environment around us. Right. So we are able to add virtual information or even completely mask the physical world that we have. And the technology that we're going to use is actually not that essential there, but this is just the concept and the idea of this um, idea of spatial, uh, spatial computing. So the quick example I'm giving you that currently, when we want to have digital um, technology in our um, life, it is always hidden in this, in this pixel prison that we have. But with the vision of everyday accessible augmented virtual and mixed reality, we will be able to add this digital information in the environments around us um, and even partially mask the, the environment that we have with a certain overlay that we want to have. And we saw already this. Um, this continuum presented by Paul Milgram, where he is talking about completely real, completely virtual, and everything in between. So the idea is that future technologies like these potential classes are going to be something that I'm going to be able to completely mask the environment or just partially add some form of uh, digital content. And um, in the research that I was um, recently working on, and there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of uh, different directions here. And I want to tell you two per different perspectives, how to approach this type of research, or how people approach this type of research. And the one thing is like this positivist approach of looking for application scenarios and trying to make this technology desirable. And what we are oftentimes doing there, and I'm just going to give you a few quick examples, is, for instance, thinking of if we're going to be able to use this technology, virtual reality in our daily lives, there are some challenges to it. So if we're going to use 
um, let's say gestural interaction in a public space. Imagine I have the access to this technology everywhere where I am. I'm gonna have problems if I'm gonna reach out for the interaction and gonna hit and bump into things in the environment. So people explore, and this was one of the works that we did, how can we maybe have a type of interaction that's just a little bit more, uh, or let's say less uh, space demand. Another aspect is to explore um, because of this mobility, having this technology everywhere with us, um, there comes new challenges of what, how can we create certain types of haptic feedbacks. And the projects that we did here was using a flywheel on the back of uh, a virtual reality at mounted display. And through control of the speed of the flywheel, we're actually able to impede the motion of a user, right? So it's more difficult for you to look around. And all of these projects, they have the goal of how can we make it more usable, more desirable to reach these, um, like a, a wider audience, so to say. And uh, a particular direction that I'm going to, again, briefly mention here is um, one of the big challenges we found in the prior research was that when you use virtual reality with people in your surrounding, if you present your new VR headset to some friends or colleagues, it's always difficult, it's always difficult to include them in this type of interaction. And the point is there is a problem in asymmetry here. So we um, explored different ways of how can we include people in the environment that have no access to virtual reality um, technology to still experience the virtual world. And here in the project, we actually used projections on top of the immersed user. So me, I'm the, uh, the one outside, I have a mobile screen, I can look into the virtual world and also see what is going on through the projection screen. So this is also one of the problems that will um, come with this technology. It's gonna be a little bit more accepted uh, and become parts of our daily lives. And we had different variations of, of systems that we proposed. Uh, one was the projection, the other one here, uh, face display, where we said maybe we have to reshape the technology itself. Can we add displays um, to the head-mounted display, a VR head-mounted display, so people in the environment are able to understand what I'm doing or even interact with me. And um, this were a lot of virtual reality applications, but augmented reality has a similar problem, right? So when I use my HoloLens, only I am able to see what, uh, what virtual content I'm interacting with. So we propose a modification where we say, can we use a projector again, coupled on um, with such an augmented reality headset and project information in an environment and allow people to see what I'm seeing and have again, this interaction. So these projects, I quickly wanted to go over and show you that this is one approach that um, uh, the academic field is looking at uh, mixed reality or the HCI academic field. And the idea here is oftentimes trying to make this technology uh, more usable and desirable to push a little bit towards this notion of saying, okay, this is going to be something we're going to use in our daily lives. And there are questions that we saw this before already. How can we apply this in, in industry to actually get a benefit out of it? Or questions that people go like, uh, what are killer apps of AR, VR, which I, I'm not a big fan and I'm happy to discuss this at, uh, at the end. And this is one side. And I want to show you a different side, a different perspective. That is the research that we are now um, trying to uh, or developing more and more. And this perspective is actually trying to not think of what do we need to do to get to this point of enable this technology, but it's asking the question, well, let's assume it's gonna be something we will have in our daily lives. Let's, let's go for this point and say like, there's gonna be the ability to have this technology and then ask what are gonna be the important questions here to ask. And the important questions that we argue are, got to be more on this perspective of how will this technology impact us humans over the um, over the year research scenario and how can we shape it to serve what we are actually expecting from it. And the parallel I want to draw here is that the type of research, and this is again, a phone is something like well established already. And I think the more critical questions we have with this type of technology are things like overconsumption, things like privacy issues, impact on mental health, or creation of social bubbles through content access to social media. So these are not the questions of looking for where can I actually make use of it for somewhere, but what are the problems that come from a constant exposure? And I'm going to give you two examples of projects that uh, one that we already um, presented, or what we're going to present, we got it accepted at a, a conference recently. And here we went to this thought and said, okay, assuming we have constant access to augmented reality, and I have the ability to alter the perception, I can alter everything around people that I talk to face to face. I can alter their, their, um, their skin color, I can alter their, their clothes. We asked to what degree will people feel comfortable doing this alteration to others or feel comfortable getting altered? And uh, we found that there's an interesting gap that people are more 
um, let's say, feel more comfortable in being altered. Well, there's a problem. Uh, uh, we found that there's this gap of like people are more uncomfortable changing the appearance of others. And we had this uh, more complex, let's say, study environment where we were able to quantify what regions are people more likely to change or not. And we started this discussion about should we even have this ability to alter the visual appearance of our conversational partner, even if it's only perceivable by us. So this is an important aspect of it, right? It's not like a sharing, but it's just me seeing it. But should I still have the ability to change the um, appearance of others? And um, another project that we are um, also got a, uh, just recently accepted was looking at potential, um, let's say, psychological side effects of being exposed to this type of technology. And one of the big parts that people are arguing is that simulator sickness is a big issue uh, when you use virtual reality. However, we found in a study that um, where we uh, were um, asking users to use virtual reality for a certain duration and then ask them what criteria or what um, like specific factors were the most ones that contributed to this comfort. And what we found that the, the biggest issue right now is ergonomics, meaning that the, just the, the bulkiness of wearing the headset. Uh, but another interesting aspect was that digital eye strain, so the discomfort to our eye over longer exposure is something that is more severe than simulator sickness itself. And um, I'm going to end the, uh, the talk with the last project that we're currently uh, working on with my uh, PG Wendy Sang that I'm co-supervising with Samuel Horo and Eric Lecoligny from Telecom Paris. And here I'm going to show you a quick video called Harmful VR. And um, a phenomenon when we look at, ooh, let me mute this a little bit. So a phenomenon that happens when you see you demo with reality to people is oftentimes there's some form of accidents happen. And they are partially related to things that David was talking about, right? We already believe this world and we end up doing um, like hurting people by accident in the environment or running into walls or having other forms of insights. And looking at this, our question now is as interaction designers, are we actually able to design a virtual reality application or some presentation to make this do deliberately? So can we remote control the user, but also with the question in mind of, can we actually make them do um, dangerous things? And if so, how can we um, start protecting ourselves or be aware of the potential negative implications that could come from such usage um, scenario? Okay, um, so this was, uh, I leave you with this little bit of aftertaste, and I'm happy to discuss uh, some of the uh, yeah, projects and locations that I mentioned. Okay, now. thank you very much, Jana. Thank you. Uh, so now we're ready to, to uh, answer to your question, if you have some. Um, We are ready for that. <laughs> Do not hesitate. It's uh, on the uh, part uh, called question and response. If you have some, it's quite now because we have uh, about 10, 10, 15 minutes and not, not really more uh, for, for this station. And of course, they will, they will have a replay uh, of, uh, of it and um, in, in some, um, some days, but um, it's uh, more interesting by uh, on live. Um, we have a question of uh, Maxim Lehmann. So he says that uh, it's very interesting. And uh, what do you think of Elon Musk Neuralink project and its ethical implication? So. <laughs> um, interesting. You are maybe. Um, John or David? Hands yeah, uh, I mean, so for, for the people who don't know what, what this is, Neuralink, uh, Elon Musk uh, has supported a startup who was working on implement, I mean, ins inserting within the brain of some people uh, a device that will make it possible to do some kind of brain computer uh, interaction. Um, in a much more um, easier, easy and uh, frequent way than what is currently done uh, through either um, tight, I mean, professional um, uh, uh, BCI, uh, so devices that can do uh, brain, uh, comment dire en français, en anglais, le... 
Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, no. Okay, anyway, what, what you find in, at, at the doctors, uh, it, it's really cumbersome, it's really painful to use. And then you have the gamer stuff, which are uh, at the surface of the head and only detecting a few parameters of, uh, of what the brain can, can provide. Quite useful for, for um, your feedback and some stuff, but not enough to really be able to con control machines with the brain. And he, so he solved uh, or he financed a, a company who solved this issue by uh, implementing those, th those hardware inside the brain for good, kind of. So obviously uh, it's like the paradigm of uh, um, like the augmented human and, uh, and the, the cyborg uh, and the, the, the superhero and basically what, what is despite depicted in, in a lot of Hollywood movies. Um, which is the common imaginary of, of uh, most American, and because their presence are, are, is, is huge in, in everywhere, uh, this of this cinema in Hollywood, it, it tends to influence a lot of our uh, entrepreneurs uh, everywhere. And I believe that uh, we should change that uh, by providing a different kind of imaginary um, to uh, our young entrepreneurs. So the one who hopefully will uh, listen to us now, uh, uh, claiming that uh, what would make the success of, of some innovation is, is may not be a super high tech stuff and would have a huge impact in terms of uh, fighting um, the climate change and, 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 and positive stuff and not just become, be, become a hero with superpowers uh, that make a self person be bigger. So that's my point of view. And actually at DS, we, at DESO system, we, we really want to provide uh, a way for our users and customers to imagine innovation that are able to harmonize product, nature, and life mm -hmm. and do sustainable innovation. This is our uh, mission and uh, it's very European. It has nothing to do with the GAFAS. And I hope that Europe is going to react in front of this kind of uh, topic. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. Um, do you have some co commentaries, uh, Jan, or do you want to? I mean, uh, I think, I think, max? yeah, I think we should distinguish here heavily between brain computer interaction, right? The concept, the general academic concept between it and Elon Musk's startup. There's already a lot of the critical voices behind this, the, the things that he's able to achieve. I think there's quite some overclaiming of the ability. I think what they were able to do is they implanted it in the pig and were able to reconstruct the motions of uh, them. So it's, I think the general neuroscience uh, uh, field is also a little bit critical about this. The core idea of brain computer interfaces is something longer to discuss. I think this is, and there's a lot of ethical implications of to what degree are we opening our minds? To what degree are we free in the thing that we think? And what could be the implications that we have constant access to all of this? But yeah, I think this is gonna uh, uh, be out of scope for this discussion here as a quick answer. But it's yeah. very much aligned to what you pre presented, Jan, because it's probably the next step after spatial computing. Basically, and it's even a closer integration of this technology inside the body, and not uh, where 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 worn on the body. It's interesting. Because it's so difficult for us to think about how we can control or actually interact with things just through the the use of our minds or even implicit right to what degree is it an explicit action that I do to what degree is it just an implicit sensing of my thoughts and actions that goes in the field of context that we're computing so it's it's yeah I think it's a it's a large and complicated topic and it is really involved with a lot of implications of how much uh, privacy do we develop right how much more information that we get I mean think about the leaks that we had with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook imagine we had addition on top of this not overly the, the behavioral data but all types of data that we could have from the um, from the brain at this moment this is, this is incredibly scary it's already true. I mean, uh, we we see eye trackers in most of the uh, the mm. VR headsets that are going to hit yeah. the market. Uh, mm. You can start to see EMGs, so they can sense the mm. the, the muscular activity, in particular, to be able to predict uh, what is your your facial expression. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of uh, deep learning uh, on top of that uh, that is able to extract uh, tons mm. of 
information while you you that you're not aware of i mean the the system knows more than you do about your deep non uh, conscious uh, interests mm. uh, so very amazing application for medical positive application and mm. super dense for mm. hackers who, who could really control uh, what people would do in the real world and, and mm. get influenced by whence the experience has stopped mm. if i have would you minute. And even what you think, right? So think about the, uh, about the notion of being able to understand when you're in a sensitive state, right? So we know that we're at a certain emotional state. We are more prone to certain like messages towards us. Exactly having an understanding of this and then being able to like leverage on this. Leverage through advertisement is the most obvious one, but this is even the, the, the least scary, I would think. Thinking of the way that we have right now bubbles, social bubbles. Like literally, we are building the perfect machine that is able to create even even more scarier social bubbles or like belief bubbles that we're gonna live in. So this is just going more towards the transparency of the user. How much are we giving up, um, willing to get the benefits from it? And this is going to be this calculation: is it is it worth? Is it going to be worth? It? And I think with with the impact of social media, we are starting to have this discussion more and more and thinking about this. But I feel we're currently focusing on traditional media that we have right now. There, they should be just bigger debate about this whole field of immersive technology that comes on top of this and the concept of presence and immersion and embodiment is just going to be an amplifier to all these effects that we're seeing right now uh, with, uh, uh, with the exposure to digital media. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Jen. Uh, I have a question from uh, Aline Beck, uh, who has, uh, she, she worked to, to in the to the Xfab um, uh, places in the dry year. so she she's there and we are very happy of that and uh, she say uh, our VR is very visual and uh, often limited by GPU performance you mentioned aptic to your foresee development focused on other senses um, this is a question for um, um, Francois uh, about you know the aptic no. um, <clears throat> well quickly because I, I think I, I don't uh, have really the answer but uh, the, the more you get uh, a detailed simulation and uh, hello Aline that includes mm -hmm. uh, in fact physical uh, physical simulation the more you will need easier people or either a solution to build the content. And it's uh, from my perspective, it's down to how you do you make it cost effective. So, but I think it's an excellent question. Maybe Jan would have some insights about it. Oh, raise hand. I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's a there's a larger there's a larger research push towards taste interfaces, smell interfaces. I think what we are all lacking here, um, the, I can say about the the research projects now, even for haptics. There's a lack of a like complete vision of like what what is it that we want to achieve? What is the perfect haptic device? And it's still unclear. What we're doing is we're building all these little technologies and tools that are able to cover one particular aspect, cover kinesthetic um, feedback, cover some restriction of the hands, cover shearing. These are all really subtle little solutions. But what is the, the perfect vision? We have a clearer vision for. Um, the visual part, right? Something like light fields are promising us to be able to um, have a full reconstruction of the, the visual appearance and virtual reality. But for haptics, we're lacking this. And even going further for gustatory, so for the taste of olfactory displays, it's all something that is has a lot of challenges in there, but there are some like individual projects addressing it. So, I mean, the, the biggest issue with, uh, like, uh, with olfactory displays are, so when I create a smell, um, how fast can I switch? So I created a smell. Now I also have to remove the smell again if I want to create another smell, right? So there's a lot of, um, let's say, uh, large issues. But I think what also, uh, what David was talking about, I think we are able to get a really good sense of presence and immersion already with the visual and auditory uh, feedback that we have already at a relatively good state and adding some part of haptics already reaching a, a quite, um, let's say, um, convincing experience where we are able to do positive things. And, yeah. I'd like to add something. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, experiments uh, regarding sensory substitution. 
for instance, if you do a fitting task, like you want to try to have a, a part uh, go inside a, a hole or something, uh, obviously would like a, a force feedback uh, harm, arm, which cost uh, back to 50K uh, at Haption, but it's really a very, very interesting piece of device, but that will never enter the consumer market. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of experience where you substitute the uh, uh, haptic feedback by uh, visual and audio uh, synthesis. For instance, you display arrows at the location of the uh, of the frictions of a certain color, if it's uh, parallel or perpendicular to to the surface, and this kind of stuff. And the brain has its capacity to 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 merge and integrate various sensors uh, and provide uh, uh, interesting information. So what what really I would like to, to say to all those uh, brilliant uh, polytechnic uh, students and, and others, um, you can be super smart engineers and build extremely complex uh, machinery to try to replicate uh, uh, existing stuff that stimulate the senses. Let me just give a small example. Uh, uh, a, a walking uh, um, uh, mat, un tapis roulant, where, I mean, you can either do like a super complex multi-band that rotates into a multi-directional trade mill, that's the word I was looking for, that is going to cost you millions and do a super huge noise and so on. And it will maybe let you walk in place uh, while wearing a VR headset so you can really walk naturally um, anywhere. Second option, if you really study VR science, uh, in case there is any VR science, but there is, the AFXR community is full of people who use the VR science and not just the technology. Um, you can do a retargeted walking. What is retargeted walking is trick the brain to think that when you walk and when you turn the head, the real world is really turning at the same uh, uh, angle as you do in the virtual world and conversely. And so you, you let people walk in a space like it's 10 by 10 and they walk naturally and uh, there is some element that they look at, but you trick them and the people are just doing a kind of circles everywhere. They have the feeling they walk. Some work, so some walls as well are, are supposedly flat, but they are curved. And so you follow and you touch uh, and all that will, will solve a, a very complex problem, which is to let someone walk indefinitely in a fin finite world without technology. And so that would be my conclusion. Uh, don't look for uh, engineering to solve problems. Look for human factors, HMIs, uh, uh, neuroscience first. Uh, and then if you don't find, uh, go, go for technology. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, we, we have some more questions. Do you have time because it's two o'clock? Uh, could we could we go on with uh, just one more question? Is it possible? One more question? The negotiation. <laughs> um, is it there one? So so it, it is a remark from Dorian Mouton. They say, uh, "Thanks a lot for your intervention. Very interesting. In France, we have a lot of startup innovation for study. Just a little part in Digital Twins project on future industry." So my question is the big actor want to invest and create business partnership with the startup innovation to have an accelerated special strategic program. So um, big act, yeah. I mean, I can answer for, for mm. on behalf of uh, an, an industrial group, that's a system. So we do have uh, uh, an acceleration and incubation program for startups at the 3D Experience Lab. So you can look at uh, yeah. Google that and find it. Uh, some of the uh, startups in uh, uh, in Polytechnic has already joined forces with us or are in the process of, and we work with a lot of other uh, incubator and accelerators that are in contact with startups. Um, but that's exactly what uh, we, we look for. Uh, uh, making open innovation with, with the ecosystem uh, because we, we all know that um, startups uh, have the capacity to take risk that a large group cannot take 
because they are expected to make profit, the large groups, and the startup is just uh, funded by uh, by a capital that is known to be um, uh, uh, more risky. Um, and so startups uh, have the capacity to solve, <coughs> to invent new, new, uh, new stuff that would not happen in, in large groups. So there is a definite way to, to join forces. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so I think it's, um, we, we, you, do you have time a little five to two, three minutes or yes, it's possible. Um, just wondering from uh, Fouad Ben Bendris, just wondering if the next industrial revolution, the fifth one uh, would be balance of mix between uh, AI, uh, AR, VR, and uh, MR. Uh, what you uh, what do you think about that? So about the um, the the mix the mix reality. So you oh, maybe um, 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 be François, you can have um, some. Um, comments about it well uh, i think if we are talking about industrial revolution i think yeah. we are talking again about productivity and cost cost efficiency um probably something is gonna happen but um it probably won't come from where we expect it uh, uh, at the moment i myself i'm looking for use cases of augmented reality in the industrial sector. I mean, stuff to help uh, blue colors to be more productive. And um, I, I'm, I'm not conv convinced yet. Uh, so I don't know, probably something is going to happen, but um, I don't mm -hmm. have any insight about it yet. Okay. And Jen, you have a, some commentary about it? Well, uh, probably a limited uh, insight to what degree it's going to be industrial um, impact. So I have not enough background in some form of economics to make this um, a question. Yeah, I can. What I can say is that it's definitely so. This combination of this technology is definitely going to be something that's going to change or impact us as a society on a global scale, not particularly just industry. Having the ability to um, constantly display and change the environments that we're in and having them so perceived, so like highly realistic that it's difficult going to be to distinguish what is real and what's not. It's going to have huge social implications on us as a, as a civilization in general. Uh, I could add something. Um, we, we saw that uh, some teams who were, uh, I would say in the 90s or uh, early uh, 20s, were focusing on, on leveraging VR and AR has uh, pivoted technologically wise uh, to um, AI and machine learning in particular, uh, because um, potentially VR, uh, as you know, is out of the Gartner hype cycle. I mean, it's something that is not is now, I would say, deployed. Um, and even if it raises a lot of new scientific challenges, especially when entering the, the large consumer uh, public um, and ethical and and and, and um, social and uh, health uh, impacts um, but uh, <clears throat> sorry um, I lose my track um, can someone recall me what uh, we were discussing oh, yeah the, the the cycle. so um, yeah yes. so as is now a very hype technology within uh, the uh, technology players like startups and, and labs, I would say. And uh, because it has huge implications, I, I, I see that the curve of this kind of research is going to, to uh, definitely be more, um, higher than the one and, and the slope than the one of XR in terms of um, traction, I would say, also from investors, and, and it's it's the way it goes. So startups would be in XR has been hugely funded uh, like five, 10 years ago. I mean, especially after the Oculus uh, 
but now um, the, the I would say that this uh, golden time has passed, and uh, companies are looking for other kind of deep technology players um, than than XR. But the good news is that uh, deep learning stuff uh, is bringing a lot of um, to the XR world in in um, a lot of areas. In particular, for for instance, displaying um, uh, people's uh, uh, in inside a, a three D space with a three D camera without having a green screen. This is now very much uh, very easy to to do with uh, machine learning, whereas previously you had to do uh, uh, chroma, I mean, I mean, you were using uh, chroma king and this kind of stuff. So that means that the, the capacity to deploy uh, VR, for instance, uh, when, when you would like, or a mixed situation where you would like with your VR headset to be, still be able to look at other people in the room, but you're not interested into the other stuff, uh, because you are going to play uh, ping pong and you're still in your office, but you would like to really be like in a sport court or whatever, uh, that is going to, to be possible. So to conclude on, on that topic, um, the, 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 the mix of, of AI and uh, XR is definitely something that will happen and will, uh, will feed uh, new offer solutions and use cases. Um, and the mixed reality uh, continuum will be even more blurred thanks to that uh, because uh, uh, the future is probably, I mean, we'll have spatial computing, meaning stuff in the real world that you interact and, 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 and with and some that you just want to ignore and virtual stuff uh, you would include into that word and conversely, and that will be a kind of eternal and perpetual mix of all that. I think technologically wise, we're still far off. So I agree with you that, I mean, like the current hype of like the fake Facebook devices, they're quite good in terms of creating this virtual reality experiences. But this this vision, this notion that you said of spatial computing, like this whole blur of mix, and even not talking about video see-through, but having like an optical see-through headset that is able to enable any of this. I think we're far off to actually have any of this. Um, yeah. we need optical see-through. At the end of the day, maybe uh, uh, video see-through is just going to be the uh, enough way to to look at both real and virtual worlds with no I mean you see the this uh, Swedish um, yeah Vario Vario I mean they, they did not solve the virgin secundation conflict yet that's just one of it right uh, a big issue but uh, they they solved the the capacity to do super precise and and stuff with video CISRO and I mean it's still a 2D image, right? It's it's impressive the way that they have the center to display in the center of it with a high resolution. Yes, it comes close to let's say something to the visual field, but only in the fovea region, right? It's like hard to fix there. You don't need this is exactly fitting my previous uh, comment. They were intelligent enough to to just know that the human vision only focuses uh, ha has a only a high resolution foveated vision in the mm -hmm. fovea. So, they don't, you, so you don't have to have a super high resolution everywhere. And you just happen to rotate your head following your sight. And so most of the time, it's not a challenge. I've tried it many times. And you just don't want to look at something very uh, resolved on the corner of your head. So this is what I'm saying about like technology versus, I mean, pure engineering versus human factors. And I mean, this is, I completely agree that the basic, like a clever engineering approach is including and is starting actually at the human perceptional system. And um, there is, but I would still argue there's a certain ground of limitations we have for passive haptics, for redirected walking, as you mentioned before, right? We already know there are like hard limitations to, to what degree are you able to rotate without the perception of the user. So we have a maximum limit of at least I need this space to have and passive haptics of um, simulating some form of weight, right? We also did a project when just visually changing your um, arm is able to give you a perception of weight, but it's all limited to a certain threshold that you're able to achieve. There's still going to be this, um, this, this, this break at one point and the limitation of what are you able to render within this world. 
And also with this visual system, I really, I mean, I'm curious. It's going to be interesting if the future is going to be to some degree with the visual see, uh, video see through display. I would have been disappointed, I have to admit. I would have wished for something that is not trying to recreate something that already have in this, um, yeah, through, through um, a technology that I feel could have been um, improved or could have been alternatively if we have something like a really well functioning, like the light field display that Magic Leap was promising us at one point that, that actually would have been with a high degree of value and actually be able to completely reproduce the light rays that we have. Um, and having this augmented reality Turing test. So I display a cup and you're not able to tell is it a real cup or not a real cup. I'm having this technology is something that I feel is really gonna be interesting, but I'm not sure, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit pessimistic here if we're if we're gonna be that close. But yes, we are definitely. I think it's going to be a larger consumer market. And we see this with, unfortunately, Facebook having a dominant grip around this. But um, this is yeah. something we're going to see sooner. I think we can yeah. speak of that uh, for hours. I see that Mathilde may want to. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's very, it's a very interesting answer. Yeah. So, but um, unfortunately, we have to, to close the session. And uh, but uh, we have some more questions, but I will uh, give you those. those uh, I will communicate those questions after the after the session. So thank you, thank you very much for the participation and uh, to many thanks to our guests. So and uh, the next edition will be will take place uh, in uh, March. So on uh, another um, thematic, very different. So I hope we, you will be uh, on, uh, on uh, the rendezvous. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, see you. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Uh, and yes.